I investigate cults by living amongst them, but I think I've taken things too far this time. My morbid fascination for cults began long ago, when I was a young man, hearing about a terrible incident in which a great many people died. Now, I naturally felt immense sympathy for the corrupted minds and souls lost that day, but something in me yearned to understand the psychological aspect of it all better. The years went by, and my interest only grew with the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. Eventually, though, I found my calling. I decided I wanted to quietly investigate cult psychology by embedding myself within them. Or, as any normal person would say, I joined a bunch of cults. It started small, you know, religious kind of stuff. Groups similar to Scientology. These were a good starting point, because their collective basis was somewhat still grounded in reality. Not that I was ever the spiritual type, but I could see the appeal even if to someone like myself the ideas posited remained completely ridiculous. Through the years hopping from religious cult to religious cult, I learned a great deal about why people gave everything they had up to join these groups. Now, you might have already guessed the answer, but seeing it and being able to walk into a room of devotees and feel its thick, choking presence in the air made it so much more real. Fear. Naturally, I was forced to partake in their activities, to eat their food, to drink their drink. I had to become them, or else I'd be discovered. With the comparatively gentle nature of the earlier cults I joined, this wasn't much of an issue, but the constant sense of obsessive duty began to take its toll on me as the intensity rose. From reality-grounded religious cults, I moved on to animal sacrifice cults, and then on to UFO cults before ending up here. One beyond simple description. After a run-of-the-mill pre-joining research period, I found myself stumbling through thick brush and leaves to attend my initiation deep within the woods at the edge of town. Usually I had to travel pretty extensively to join a new cult, but this one was based close enough that it'd be far more convenient than the other options I had lined up. The thought of having my own bed to go back to every once in a while, rather than living in their commune, indefinitely sounded nice too. Eventually, I came across a group of young-looking men and women standing in a large circle with interconnected hands. A stone was seemingly suspended in the air, just above a raging campfire, and a man stood next to it with his back to me. Without turning, he spoke. I see our latest brother has arrived. Welcome to our blessed commune. Um, thank you. My name is... No names. He retorted midway through my sentence. Well, er, okay. I'm glad to be here. What would you like me to do? I was familiar with initiations, and the audience surrounding me suggested it'd be more of the same. Taking an oath, reading some words from a scroll, repeating a phrase from a long-forgotten language, that kind of thing. The man still stood with his back to me and commanded me to walk closer to him, closer to the stone above the campfire. As I walked, the carvings on the stone became clearer to me. It was a face, and not one that was human either. Take this dagger and draw blood. Ooh, I'd never been asked to give blood to whatever idea I'd be pretending to worship before. I felt like I was in a bad horror movie, and I loved it. The sharp tip of the blade he handed me behind his back pierced the skin across my palm, and I grimaced before he finally turned to me. He was as young as the others in the circle around me, and yet the look in his eyes was one of a weathered man, someone who'd seen a lot, done a lot. Provide the stone with your offering, he spoke whilst his eyes obsessively followed mine. Crimson red blood dripped down into the crevices of the carving before me, and eventually onto the fire. My train of thought was interrupted by the cult members around me, breaking into a collective hymn. I tried to make out what they were saying, but it was all unintelligible. Part of me thought it must have been the language of whatever entity they were worshipping, but it didn't sound like any language at all. Then they began to walk away. Backwards. Creating more distance between me and them, yet never breaking eye contact. The chanting grew louder and louder, and the structure of the circle remained as it had been the leader traveling in the middle, along with the suddenly mobile fire and stone. Part of me wanted to follow, but another, more instinctual part screamed at me to accept their departure. I shouted out, though, in an effort to understand what they were doing, where they were going. It yielded no results, and before long I was standing amongst the tall trees and whistling wind, completely alone. Thankfully, I managed to make my way home from those woods. I've come to find out that I brought something horrible along along with me. I spent the next few days trying to find out anything beyond what my initial research into the hometown cult, as I've come to refer to it, revealed. With no contact from the people in the woods, I was left to my own devices and scoured the internet for anything that might have helped. 
Eventually, I came across something. Not much, but something. A newspaper archive from 127 years ago, detailing the mass disappearance of every 35-year-old in the town. Supposedly, there had been 37 of them all those years ago, and the townsfolk woke up on the morning of June 27th to find they were all missing. Children walked into the bedrooms of their parents to find sheets strewn on the floor, and weary husbands awoke to their sleeping wives no longer by their sides. Rumor at the time had it that their personal effects were found in a circle deep within the woods at the edge of town, just like the circle I'd seen. I tried to glean some context into the investigation and what happened next from later editions of the paper, but had no luck. It was as if there was a single mention of the incident, and then it too disappeared. Within a few days, and without much progress beyond the newspaper I'd found, my mind drifted away from the topic, and I found myself looking forward to a little break from my cult investigating facilities. My ignorant bliss didn't last long enough though, unfortunately. Before long, a sense of duty began to envelop me, call out to me. I began to hear the hymn of the circle and the blood-soaked face of the stone entity in the dreams. Its face became engraved onto my mind, and it would just be there. Present. Always. I'd never been a person with a troubled mind, even given my escapades into mass psychological delusions. But the hymn grew louder. Clearer. It wasn't incomprehensible any longer, and the things it was telling me were terrifying. The fear enveloped my every waking moment, and my every dreaming moment. Perhaps I should have known my little hobby would someday move beyond delusions of salvation. Move into real-life pain, torment. It wanted me to hurt myself, to give my life away as I'd pledged. As I'd pledged? What the fuck? I thought before finally realizing my little blood offering was far beyond the realm of simple initiation. Something in the woods called back to me. All right. Here it goes. I've never posted here before, but what happened to me last weekend still has me rattled. I need to get it off my chest. And maybe, just maybe, someone here can help me make sense of it. I live in a small town in Montana, nestled in the Rockies. My house is just a few miles from a vast expanse of national forest land. It's beautiful, sure, but it can be incredibly isolating. That isolation is part of why I love it. But after what happened, it's also why I'm terrified. Last Saturday, I decided to take a late afternoon hike. There's a trail I frequent, one that winds up to a small clearing overlooking the valley. I brought my dog Max, a German Shepherd who's never been spooked by anything in his life. We set off around 3 p.m., figuring we'd be back before sunset. The hike up was uneventful, the forest was serene, and the only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the occasional chirping of birds. Max was his usual self, darting ahead, and then circling back to me. It was perfect, exactly why I moved out here. When we reached the clearing, I sat down on a fallen log to catch my breath and enjoy the view. Max was sniffing around, but after a few minutes he froze. He was staring at the tree line on the opposite side of the clearing, his ears perked up, and his body tense. What's up, boy? I asked, trying to see what he was looking at. That's when I noticed it. At first it was just a shadow moving between the trees. I squinted, thinking maybe it was a deer or something, but then it stepped out into the clearing. It looked like a person, but not quite. It was tall and gaunt with limbs that seemed too long for its body. Its skin was pale, almost grayish, and its eyes, its eyes were completely black. Max started growling, a low, menacing sound that I'd never heard from him before. The figure took a step forward, and that's when I noticed it was mimicking my movements from earlier, almost like it was replaying a tape of me walking. Then it spoke. Max, what's up, boy? The voice was mine, exactly mine. I felt a chill run down my spine, and Max started barking furiously. The figure stopped, tilted its head, and then turned around, disappearing back into the trees. I didn't stick around to see if it would come back. I grabbed Max by the collar and practically ran down the trail. It was getting dark, and every sound made me jump. Max kept looking back, growling intermittently. We made it home just as the last light was fading. I locked all the doors and windows something I rarely do out here. I tried to calm myself down, rationalizing that maybe it was just some sort of trick of the light, or maybe another hiker messing with me. But deep down, I knew that wasn't it. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every creak of the house made me jump, and Max was restless, pacing around the living room. Around 2 a.m., just as I was starting to doze off, I heard it.
Max. What's up, boy? It was faint, almost like a whisper, but it was definitely my voice. It was coming from outside, near the tree line. I didn't sleep at all after that. When the sun finally came up, I took Max and drove into town. I needed to be around people, somewhere that didn't feel so exposed. I told my friend Jake about it, and he just laughed, saying I'd been out in the woods too long. Maybe he's right. Maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But I can't shake the feeling that something out there saw me, remembered me, and called back in my own voice. I haven't been back to that trail since. Every time I think about going for a hike, I hear that voice again, and I can't bring myself to leave the house. I don't know what I saw, but I'm sure of one thing. It saw me too. Has anyone else experienced something like this? I need to know I'm not losing my mind.